binary search tree. In the first of two videos, we begin with an overview of applications of tree in computing. This will be to represent hierarchical information for compression and for efficient access to elements of a data structure. We will implement a linked tree and we, be, we will pay a particular attention to a kind of tree called a binary search tree. Let's start with some definition. So what we call a binary tree is a hierarchical structure such that there are nodes. These, these nodes are storing values. So here, eight and 15, for example. And each one of these nodes, because it's a binary tree, has at most two children. These children, we will call them left and right. Okay, so eight has a left child, which is five, and eight as a right child, which is 15. Let's look at some of the applications of binary search trees. Or to be more precise, let's um, look at some general application of trees. Okay, so uh, trees can be used to represent hierarchical information. And one example that you're very familiar with is your hard disk. So the information is stored in a hierarchical file system. There's a top directory, the root of your disk. And this directory contains several subdirectories. You can select one of them. And if you look inside, you're going to see many subdirectories. Again, you can click and select one of these subtrees and descend traverse your tree. Another example of the use of trees in computer science is for compilers. Compilers will be representing the information of your program in the form of a parse tree. An interesting example of um, trees in computer science is the Hoffman trees uh, that are used to compress the information. We will look at the, this particular um, data structure in the coming slides. And finally, let's say that binary trees can be used to uh, implement uh, very efficiently a variety of abstract data types, such as the heaps, the priority queues, associative structures and sets, and many of these uh, data structure you will look at in your data structure course next year. Let's look at the Hoffman trees. So I don't know about you, but um, I always wonder how can we compress information? And there's two kinds of compressions. There's lossy compression and there's lossless compression. With lossy compression, as the name suggests, some information is lost. And the idea is that for files like audio files and video files, we're willing to pay a price. The price will be a slight um, degradation of the quality of the audio or the video. We're willing to pay this price so that the size of the file is smaller, so that this video is easier to send across internet. On the contrary, the lossless compression methods are methods where information is compressed and there's an algorithm to reverse the operation to uncompress the content and what we get is the original content with the lossy compression we cannot reverse the operation of compression it cannot be undone here with the lossless compression, we are able to compress the information, decompress, and we get the original input. If you focus your attention at the bottom of the screen, you see that I have a sequence of symbols, GO underscore E A G L E N S. And if we'd use uh, ASCII encoding, 
to store this information on the desk, there are nine symbols, nine characters. The ASCII letters are using eight bits. And so we would have used 72 bits of information to store that particular string. The Hoffman code algorithm uses a, um, a very simple principle where in natural languages, English and French, for instance, the frequency of the letter vary different uh, depending on the letter. So it's well known that there are many A and many E's in uh, French and English languages, and there are very few X, Q, or Z uh, letters in um, in those two languages. And this is actually the, the basis for uh, Scrabble, for the scoring system in Scrabble. So as you know, you're scoring a lot of points if you can put words on the board that are in including letters such as VKX. Um, and by the same token, a similar idea is that uh, in order to break very simple encryption code, you could look at the frequency of the letter and the codes that are occurring frequently might be corresponding to the letters A and E. So, so this is a well-known um, principle and that, that's used to create this compression algorithm. So here's how it works. So there is a code and the code is represented as a tree, a tree structure. In this tree structure, we always start at the root of the tree. So here we imagine that the input is this string of bits. It's been stored on the disk. And now our job is to decompress the information to recover the original content. So the way it works is we start reading this input. So it reads one, zero, 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 one, zero. So here, in order to decode this information, we start at the top. The code was one, zero, 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 one, zero we reach a leaf we write on the output the letter g we continue reading from where we are and we restart from the top of this tree it reads one zero zero one this is the letter o we put it on the output Again, we continue reading from where we are. It reads one, one, and one. When we encounter a leaf, we write on the output the information stored in the leaf. Let's do one more example. We continue reading from where we stop because we've just outputted a symbol we now restart from the top it reads zero one zero each time we follow the branch that has the designated character on it after reading this zero one zero we reach a leaf we write this on the output so on so forth the algorithm simply start from the top of the tree, follows the branch that corresponds to the bit of information that are read. When we reach a leaf, we write on the output the symbol that corresponds. And here, you see that the idea of the frequency of the letter has been used to create this code. We see that E is represented with three bits, whereas G is represented with six. The information in this file was represented with 38 bits. Compared to the ASCII encoding, 
this is a saving of 34 bits or it's a compression of 34 percent okay so that that's the principle behind the um, Huffman trees all right so these trees is a new topic so therefore we will be spending a few minutes here uh, talking about some definitions so trying to have a common language between me and you so that we talk about the same things okay so all the nodes in a tree have only one parent so if we look at 9 the parent is 15 if we look at 5 the parent is 8 the root of the tree is a special case the root does not have a parent each node has zero one or two children this is because we're talking here about binary search trees there are general trees but here we're interested only in the binary trees so here the root eight has two children 5 and 15. 5 has no children. We're going to call this a leaf. And 9 has one child. It's 11. So we like the analogy of the tree so much that the links between the nodes are called branches. we have this um, definition that we called a subtree a subtree is a node and its descendant so here 15 is the subtree that contains the value 9 11 15 and 29. the size of a tree is simply the number of nodes that are in the tree so one two three four five and six six is the size of this tree i can also call talk about the size of a subtree the subtree that starts at 15 contains four four nodes okay so we could also give a recursive definition for uh, a tree we could say that a binary tree is empty or a binary tree consists of a value and two subtrees. Each subtree can be empty or has a value and two subtrees. There's a concept that we call the depth of a node and it represents the number of links that we need to follow starting from the root so here obviously the root is at level zero or at depth zero five is at depth one and 15 is also at depth one if i follow two links i can reach nine and 29 and if I follow three links, then I can reach 11, starting always from the root. Okay, so this is an important slide. Um, all the trees that I've shown you so far, they have a property in common. What is it? If you need, make a pause of this video, stare at this tree, and try to find what this property is, because that's going to be the foundation for these two videos. That's going to be the key for the efficiency of this data structure. Did you find it? So the property is as follows. All the keys that are in the left subtree 
are strictly smaller than the key that is stored in a local node. All the keys that are stored in the right subtree are strictly larger than the key that is stored in that node. And this property is true for all the nodes in the tree. If you look at 15, to its left, we have 12 and 13. If you look to the right, we have 29 and 50. If we look at the node 2, to the left we have 1, to its right we have 4. You can check it for yourself. All the nodes inside this tree structure are such that the keys to the left are smaller than the key in the node and all the keys in the right subtree are larger than the key in that node. If you find a node that violates this property, it's not a binary search tree or it's a bug in the implementation. Okay, and that's going to be very, very important. So a corollary to this definition is the fact that the keys are unique. The values in the tree are unique. This is because my definition says that the keys are smaller if they're to the left and greater if they're to the right. Doesn't, we never treat the case where the values are equal. And that's going to be very important. That's, a, that's going to be key for the way the algorithms will be working for finding information, for adding information, for removing information from the tree. So, how would you implement such a data structure? What will it look like? Have we seen something in ITI 1121 that looks familiar here? Of course. So, this pretty much looks like the linked implementation of a list. In particular, the one where the nodes are doubly linked. And very similarly, where we used to have a previous and next, here we will simply have a left and right child. Whereas the information is stored linearly, where the nodes are connected one to another in a linear fashion, in a tree structure, we will be storing the information as a hierarchy. It's the method add that will create the topology of this graph. Okay, so the class node has um, at least two instance variables, left and right. Uh, there will be references of type node, obviously. And then there will be the va a value there. So think about it, where with the linked list, we didn't care so much about what kind of value could be stored in this list. That was not very important. But here, the information which is stored in the binary search tree plays a role in the way we navigate the tree structure we need to compare the values of the keys. So we need a way to force this, these uh, objects to have a method compared to. So we will make sure that value is actually comparable. And the way to do this is like so. So here we say, whoops, we say a binary search tree has a type parameter E, but we impose that the, the objects that can be used to be stored inside the binary search tree must have a method compared to, must be comparable. And they must be comparable to other objects of the same type. Just like before, we use a static nested class called node. The key difference here is that we name these variables left and right. Obviously, the name of a variable is not so important, but it makes a lot of sense and it's way easier to read the code if we use uh, these names. The object 
of the class binary search tree has one instance variable. It's pointing at the root node. So in a list, we had this instance variable head that was pointing at the first node. In a tree structure, we're going to have an instance variable called root that will be pointing at the root node of this tree. So here to the left, you can see the object of the class binary search tree has an instance variable called root. Root is pointing at an object from the class node. So here, this is how I decided to represent my nodes. A node has an instance variable called value. It's of type comparable. And then it has two instance variables, both of type nodes, pointing to the left and the right child. Here is a memory diagram for a tree that contains one, two, three, four, five elements. And here you can explicitly see all the details. So the binary search tree object has an instance variable called root. It's pointing at a node. This node has a reference variable left that's not null. It's pointing at this node here. This particular node is a leaf. You know that it's a leaf because left and right, the, the instance variables left and right of this node are null. Here on the screen, I'm showing you two different representation. On the right is the representation that I will use for most of my diagrams. It's a bit more abstract. We don't see the binary search tree object. Okay, so here's a binary search tree object. Okay, so we don't see it on the representation on the right. Likewise, when we have a leaf, we don't see that the instance variable left and the instance variable right are actually null. Okay, this is not represented on the uh, right representation. Let's implement the method contains, one of the simplest method and one that is, is actually helping us understand why the binary search trees are so useful and so efficient in computer science. So look at this tree and try to think, how would you implement a method that would be able to tell you if a value is present or not? If you need to, make a pause and think about it. You have it? So we always start at the root of the tree. And then there is a, var a variety of, of cases. So if the, the root of this tree was null, it means that the tree was empty. Of course, we cannot find the value of interest. There could be the case where the local root, the local node that we're pointing at contains the value of interest. If, it, if this is the case, then we return true, we found the information. Otherwise, we need to make a decision. Shall we go to the left or to the right? Let's look at a specific example. Let's say that we want to find the value 9 in this tree. We have to start at the root. So the root contains the value eight, not the value that we're looking for. Do I need to go to the left of the tree to find the, the information of interest? Not at all. The binary search tree is such that all the keys to the left are smaller than the value stored in the current node. So therefore nine is larger than eight, I only need to look at the right subtree. So now I'm at the node 11. 11 is not 9. So I've not found what I was looking for. 
I do not need to look to the right because 9 is smaller than 11. If it's found in this tree, it has to be to the left of 11. I now, I'm now to the left of 11 and the current node has the value of interest. I will return true. Let's look at another example where we look for the value 7. Always we start at the top. So the variable root is not null. It's pointing at the node that contains the value 8. 8 is not 7. Because 7 is smaller than 8, I know that if it exists in this tree, it must be to the left of 8. So I now go to the left child. 5 is not 7, so I've not found what I was looking for. If 7 is found in this tree, because 7 is larger than 5, it would be to the right of 5. Because the right child is null, I must conclude that the value 7 is absent from this tree. So how do you write the code? Okay, so if it's empty, then the element is not found. If the local root contains the element, we found it, return true. Otherwise, there's some routing. We need to find a path in the tree that will lead to the value or to the conclusion that the value is absent. So where do we look? If the element is smaller than the key stored in the current node, we look left. And otherwise, it must be that it's larger than, so we would look in the right subtree. So do you see a recursive algorithm here? So the recursive method on trees um, will have a similar flavor to the recursive method that we implemented for the linked lists, the linked structure that we've seen so far. And the key here will be that these methods will be very efficient. Whereas on list, you should probably not use in, use in Java recursive method. That would not be very efficient because the information is stored linearly. The size of the call stack would be proportional to the size of the list, which means that you would run out of memory very rapidly. But as we will see in the next video, with tree structure, the height of the tree which corresponds to the height of the call stack will be very small, typically less than 50 element. Okay, so here implementing recursive method will be simple. Similar to the recursive methods that we wrote for the linked structure, there will be a public and a private method. The public method receive some value. This value will be passed to the private method. But the signature of the private method will have one more parameter. It will be a parameter of type node. I'm going to call it current. And we will use this to control recursion. So here in the public method, I'm not allowing for element to be null. That makes a lot of sense because we need this information to do the routing in the tree. I need to look at the keys to decide if I need, I'm going to go left or right. So therefore, we do not allow element to be null. The same thing will be true for the method add. It will not allow us to add null values to the tree structure. Okay, so now, since we've checked this precondition, we're going to call the recursive method contains and we're going to start at the root. What's the base case? Well, as we said before, it could be that current is null. 
therefore we've not found what we were looking for we return false there's another base case if element is equals to current dot value we found what we were looking for and of the word return true general case we need to do the routing in the tree shall we search to the left or to the right it it will be only one of the two options so we compare element with current value if the result of this test says that the element is smaller than current dot value we will search for the value of interest in the left subtree otherwise we know that it's not equals we know that it's not smaller it can only be larger if it's found in this tree it's going to be found in the subtree that starts at current dot right and so this gives us the following private method it's a method contained we control it through the parameter current which is of type node the base case the first base case is if current equals null we've not found what we were looking for return false otherwise let's compare element and current dot value if they are equals if compare to returns the value zero we found what we were looking for return true otherwise if the test says element is smaller than current dot value look to the left make a recursive call where this call will start with current dot left otherwise it was greater look to the right recursive call passing current dot right okay so obviously only one path only one of the two cases is explored we never need to go back because we know that the information is stored in such a way that all the keys that are to the right are larger all the keys that are to the left are smaller and this is the key idea to make the binary search tree so efficient is the method contains necessarily recursive we're going to talk about this idea a number of times during these two videos but here the answer is no whenever we're writing a method and the algorithm requires to visit a single path down this tree we can easily write a non-recursive method on the contrary whenever we need to visit the left and the right subtree then the methods will be absolutely easier to implement with recursion in fact there's only one case that is easy to write without recursion um, the other cases are fairly complicated to write so can you think of a strategy for writing this method contains that will look for an element inside the tree again i'm encouraging you to pause the video and think how would you do this if you have time just fire up your favorite code editor and write some code to do that so how does it work we will be starting at the root of the tree so i'm going to use a variable called current of type node and i'm going to initialize current to be pointing at the root of this tree and then i'm going to find my way down this tree if current is null then that's because the information was not present in the tree i will stop otherwise i'm going to look at current.value 
If it's the value of interest, found it, return true. Otherwise, I need to go one level down in the tree. If the value of interest is smaller than current dot value, I'm going to say current equals current dot left. I'm going to go down, but to the left. If the value that I'm looking for is larger than current dot value, I'm going to go down the tree, but to the right. And we will be iterating, always starting at the root and making a series of decision, going left or going right. With every iteration, we're going down one level inside this tree. Eventually, either we find the value of interest or we will encounter a current left or a current right, which is null which will be our indication that the value is not found in the tree. So I'm calling this method cur contains two, receives some element. Here there was no space on the, um, on the screen, but I should have tested if element is null, then we would throw some null pointer exception. Like so. Okay, so initially found is false. So this algorithm says, while not found, continue searching in the tree. We start at the root. So current equals to root. If during our journey, current becomes null, this will be an indication that we have not found the value of interest. If we enter this loop, it's because we have not yet found the value of interest and current is not null. We will therefore compare the element to current dot value. If the result of the test is zero, this means that element and current dot value are equals. We found what we were looking for, found equals true, and we will exit the loop. Otherwise, if the result of the test is that the element is smaller than current dot value, current equals current dot left. We go down the tree one level to the left. Otherwise, if the value was larger, we still go down, but we go to the right this time. Okay, so again, I'll be saying that uh, later as well. If the algorithm to be implemented requires visiting a single path in a tree, then we will be uh, we can easily implement a iterative method like the one here. We now talk about a concept called traversing a tree. What we're calling traversing a tree involves visiting a large number of nodes inside this tree structure and it requires going to the left and to the right. Okay, that's the operation that I'm calling traverse. Here I'm saying we're visiting a node. It means we're performing some operation on each node that we land in. And for the examples that I'm going to show you, the operation will simply be to print the content of the node, to, pr to print the actual value. With the linked list, um, there were not that many ways to traverse the structure. If it was singly linked structure, we could only traverse the list from start to end, from left to right. If it was a doubly linked structure, we can traverse the structure from start to end, from left to right, or from tail to, to head, from right to left. Okay, so there were two ways. With tree structure, 
there's a variety of ways. One way is called pre-order. When we do a pre-order traversal, we first do some operation on the local root of the subtree. Then we traverse left, then we traverse right. In the in-order traversal, also called infix or symmetric traversal, we first traverse the left subtree, then we do an operation on the current node, then we visit the right subtree. Finally, there's a third way to traverse the tree structure, the post-order traversal. In the post-order traversal, we traverse the left subtree, then we traverse the right subtree, and finally we do some operation on the current node. Let's look at some examples. Okay, so in the pre-order traversal, pre-order, okay, what we do is we visit the local route, we go left, and then we go right. Let's apply this to the tree structure and the operation here will be to write at the bottom of the screen the information when we visit the local route. I just notice here that there's an ambiguity in what I just wrote. So let's me reframe this. When we visit a local route, we're going to call this V. Here, when we go left, we're going to call this operation L. And when we go right, we're going to call it R. So we, we're doing a pre-order traversal of the tree. We, for, we start at the root. We do visit. This means printing 8. Then we go left. So I'm here. I first visit. We put the value 5 there. Then we go left. I'm here. I visit. We print the 2. We go left. There's nothing to do. We go right. There's nothing to do. We are done. Therefore, we are back here. When I'm here, I've already done visit. I've already done left. We're going to go right. I'm going right. I do visit, we print seven. We go left, nothing to do. We go right, nothing to do. We're done with our three operations, we go up. We're done with the three operations, we go up. We now need to do the right operation on the root of this tree. We go to the right, we first do visit. We print 15. We then go left. We do visit. 12 is printed. We go left, nothing to do, we come back. We do right, nothing to do, we're back. We're done, we go back to the node 15. We have already done visit and left, we do right. So we visit the right subtree. First thing to do is visit. So 29 is printed. We go left. There was nothing to do. We go right. Nothing to do. We're done with visited left and right. We are back here. All three operations for 15 have been completed. We're back to the root. And this is where this stops. And you see that the pre-order traversal has printed the values in the following order. 8, 5, 2, 7, 15, 12, and 29. Okay, so this is the pre-order traversal. I will now remove all these labels from the tree. And we will do the same work for the in-order traversal. In the in-order traversal, what we're going to do is 
do everything there is to do to the left, visit, then do right. So we start at the root. The first thing is to go left. We go to node five. First thing to do is to go left. We go left. We're at the node two. First thing to do is to go left. We're back. It was an empty subtree. Then we visit. So we print two. Then we go right. It's an empty subtree. We've done all three operations, LVR. We are back to this node. We now visit, output the value five, go to the right. First thing to do is left. We go left, come back, visit, output seven, go right. Nothing to do, it's an empty subtree. We're done. We have done LVR for node five. We're back to the root. We've done, we've completed left. So we now do visit, print eight, go to the right. We are here. First thing to do is left. We go to the node 12. First thing to do is L. There was nothing to do. We do V output 12, then we do R. This is an empty subtree, so we're done. We're back now to 15. L is complete, we do V. Output the value 15. We now do R, so we're on the node 29. First thing to do is L, nothing to do. We do visit, print 29. We do R, nothing to do. All three are completed. We go back to the node 15. We're done with that. We go back to the node eight and we are done. We printed the information in order. You see that as the name suggests, the in order or symmetrical traversal prints the value in order. Two, five, seven, eight, 12, 15, and 29. Let's erase all this information. And let's do it, the last traversal, the post order traversal. In the post order traversal, what we will do is visit left, visit right, and then visit the local route. We always start at the roots, we need to go left. I now go to the node five. First thing to do is to go left. I go to node two. First thing to do is to go left, nothing to be done. Then I need to go right, nothing to be done. Then visit, we print two. I'm back to the node five, we've completed left. We now need to do right. I'm going right. First thing to do is left, nothing to do. Then we go right, nothing to do. Then we visit, so we print seven. I'm back to the node five. We've done left, right, we now do visit. So we print five. We're back to node eight. We completed left, so we now do right. I'm on the node 15. First thing to do is to go left. I'm going to 12. First thing is to go left, nothing to do. Then I go right, nothing to do. Then I visit, we print 12. I'm back to node 15. We completed left, we're now gonna go right. We're on node 29. We do left, nothing to do. We do right, nothing to do, visit. We print 29. We're now back to the node 15. We completed left, right. We now do visit. This puts 15 there. Then we go to the top node and we visit. This means printing eight. We're done. 
you see that the values were printed in the following order, 275, 12, 29, 15, and 8. Okay, so you see that what changes from one traversal to the next is when are we processing the information for the local route. Are we doing it before? Then this is pre-order. Are we doing it in between the left and right traversal? This is in order. Or are we doing it at the very end? This is the post-order traversal. What I'm calling visit for these um, examples here is a very simple operation. Visit has a parameter current of type node and I'm printing current.value. Because I'm writing recursive methods, they will be made of a public part and a private part. The private part is the recursive part. It has a parameter and each one of these methods receives the value of the root in order to start its work. In the pre-order traversal, the implementation is very trivial. If current is null, there's nothing to do. Otherwise, visit, then go left, which means pre-order passing current.left as a parameter. So in the next call, the value of current will be current.left and then pre-order of current.right. And that, that's it. This is the whole implementation of the method pre-order. And hopefully you, you now anticipate that in order to implement the in-order traversal, all I need to do is to move visit to be located in between the pre-order call passing current.left and the call to pre-order passing current.right. And if I want to implement a post-order traversal, I simply need to move visit to be the last call of this method. And, and really, this is it. The recursive methods for traversing binary search trees will typically be only a few lines long. They will not be very extensive. They're very natural. And as is the case with the recursive method for traversing the list, these methods will be controlled through the parameter current. So here, the in-order traversal receives a certain value for current. If the value is um, null, there's nothing to do. It makes a lot of sense. If I were to make another recursive call, current.left and current.right would generate a um, null pointer exception. Okay, so here I have a diagram where I'm actually showing you with great details how the calls are made. In green, there's the public method pre-order. When it's calling the recursive method pre-order, the public method passes the value of root to the parameter current. In this first call, current is pointing at the node that has the value 8. In the pre-order traversal, the first thing to do is visit, so we print 8. We now suspend the pre-order method and we make a call to pre-order passing current dot left. 
in that particular call, current is now pointing at the node that has the value five. The first thing we do is visit, which prints the value five. We now pause this call and we make one more recursive call. In the recursive call, we are passing current dot left. So in that call, current is null. If you remember, it, the code says, if current is different than null, do something else, do nothing. So we are done. We return from this. There's now a call pre-order passing current dot right. Here it is. This call terminates very rapidly. Now the call here terminates. We return the control to here. In this call, current is pointing at the root. We're now passing current dot right so that in this call, current is pointing here. We call visit, we print 11. This call here is paused. We now make a call where we pass current dot left. In that call, current points here. We do visit, print nine. We suspend the current call and we make a recursive call passing current dot left. This call terminates immediately. We then call passing current dot right. It's this call here. Again, nothing to do, we're back. We're now done with this call. We return the control to this frame here. We're making a call passing current dot right. In that particular call, current is pointing here. We do a visit, so we print current dot value, it's 15. We pause the method pre-order here and we make a call passing current dot left. It terminates very rapidly, we're back. We now pass current dot right, it's this call, it terminates. We're done with this. We return the control here, we're done. We return the control here, we're done. And we traverse this entire tree. Okay, so the observations that can be made here is that methods that follow only one path in the tree structure from the root to some internal node or some leaf are easy to implement without recursive calls. And an example of that was the method contains. The methods that visit many subtrees, they're more easily implemented using recursivity. Okay, so to wrap up, a binary search tree is a tree that satisfies the following properties. All the nodes on its left subtree have values that are smaller than the value stored in the current node, or the left subtree is empty. All the nodes on the right are storing values that are greater than the value stored in the current node, or the right subtree is empty. We've seen a linked implementation of this tree. And in the next module, in the next video, we will be looking at the removal of an element, adding an element, and various properties of the binary search trees.